Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, our guest today is Stephanie Patelis, former head of the College Republican Federation. Also, the V-Team will look at why Luther Strange is being subpoenaed in the Law Barron case. And Speaker Hubbard's protection plan pack needs a little cash. Hey, Mike, how about a payday loan? All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to the Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt. I'm joined today, as ever, by the V-Team. Hi, all. Good morning. Well, where's that money from? Is that from my uh, uh, I think George Fund? There's been some bribes <laughs> Rufus going is taking on. bribes. Shh, don't tell me. There's rumors <laughs> of bribes afoot. Anyway, Roy Moore hit the headlines this week. Uh, the Chief Justice, along with uh, Tom Parker, they issued an opinion whereby they said that the Constitutional Revision Commission is unconstitutional. Uh, Sherlana, you've been looking at that, haven't you? I have. It's an interesting opinion. It's cast as, a, as an advisory opinion. Senator Brian Taylor um, sponsored the resolution in the Senate to ask the Supreme Court for an advisory opinion, and Ju Justice Moore points out in the very first footnote of his opinion that the other seven justices have declined to speak on it. Um, and then he launches into an explanation for why he does not believe that the two articles which have been revised by the Constitution Revision Commission are in fact constitutional. Well this has been a big issue. I mean it, it clearly states that the Constitution is supposed to be revised by constitutional convention. Well there are two ways. You can either do it by an amendment under section 284 or you can do it by a constitutional convention. And he says, we didn't do it by amendment. You've done it by right. some sort by of resolution. rogue yeah. resolution, constitutional yeah. amendment, a, a commission, and that's not how it's supposed to be. I mean, do we really want to change the Constitution that badly? Well, they've been discussing this, I guess, really since the Siegel administration. Remember, oh, since Lenora 1901. Pate ran on this whole platform of right. the constitutional convention here in the state of Alabama. And we've been trying to do it for many years. I think we need to fix Medicaid and corrections before we get to the Constitutional Convention, but that's just my personal opinion. Well, we've got the longest Constitution in the free world. If, it is uh, true. If, it is if true. there was a document that did not need more amendments but needed wholesale change, it may be the Alabama Constitution of 1901. Uh, but if you're not going to call a convention, uh, I think the advisory opinion makes it pretty clear. You can't skirt that by calling this commission, setting it up, calling these people commissioners, giving them fancy titles. Well, I mean, you know, the idea of not having a convention was the fact that we didn't want lobbyist or special interest influence. I mean, you go to any of these commission meetings, and there's plenty of special interest, and there's plenty of, of uh, uh, lobbyists that are interested in how this is written. Well, that is the reason that we have the lowest property tax of any uh, state in the union is because of some special interest. Yeah. Well, but if you show up at these commission meetings, they show up, and the commissioners sit down, and they're handed notebooks of suggested... Things. Nobody ever stops and says, who prepared this? Where did it come from? Right. Who wrote this? Who got paid to produce? Who, whose payroll is financing this commission and all the research and all the drafting that goes into such a But come on, we, we've all worked in the political process, and we understand that it's the special interest groups who bring the ideas, who, are, who work in these industries that understand the things that need to be changed. I mean, right. so we make it sound like it's a bad thing to say special interest groups, but that's who drives the legislative process. The problem is with the process is what, what Justice Moore has pointed out. Now, the problem with what Justice Moore has pointed out, though, is that he was the lone voice. Um, because this is only one person who has signed on to it, it does not even have the force of an advisory opinion. Um, he did tell folks who want to challenge the process how to do it in one of the footnotes. Well, I'm with Judge Moore on this. I, I, it worries me to death that they're changing the Constitution piecemeal. But, you know, conservatives don't want the Constitution really changed. We don't like change. 
it, it's the liberals that have always wanted it so they could raise the property tax in the past. Right. And so there's, there's some problems, I think, with it. One of the funnier things that's come up this week, or maybe suspicious things that's come up this suspicious, week. Suspicious, that's probably the term. Is that uh, Attorney General Luther Strange has been called to testify for the defense in the Lowell Barron case. I mean, that is some wild has stuff. Has that ever happened it? in the history here in uh, Alabama where sure. Attorney General has been called in? On a case like and that. And governors have been listed and other things. You know, a lot of times lawyers want to make a spectacle. Defense lawyers want to make a spectacle sure. and look like they're trying to hide something. And it's a good show for the jury. It's a good show for the media. And, oh, you know, if Luther, if only they would allow him to testify, it would really crack our case wide open. But nevertheless, he's, he's not going to. He's trying to hide something. I think that's probably what's going on here. Uh, if Luther knows something, tell us what you think he knows. All right. Well, I'm going to have to take a very different perspective as a defense attorney <laughs> because I'm usually the one subpoenaing surprising, these people surprising. to testify. Well, and, and here's, here's the, the bottom line. One of the things that uh, Senator Barron is defending himself on is a selective prosecution theory. And, and, and the theory goes that he paid a bonus to one of his staff members um, at the end of the campaign, and that's what the Attorney General's office is, is prosecuting for, is that, that bonus payment. The Alabama Republican Party made these same kinds of bonus payments to several members of its staff, these win bonuses, at the end of the, the what, 2010. Right. And so that's where, I don't know that it's necessarily a spectacle as much as it is the defense wanting to say, all right, now why have you chosen to prosecute Senator Barron, um, who was on the different party from you, who was the, the losing senator there, and you haven't chosen to prosecute the, the Republican Party who did the exact same thing. So I'm like you, either either Attorney General Strange has personal knowledge or he doesn't. Well, and, for the judge and in to all decide. fairness, you know, just to open the books, uh, Attorney General Strange did the same with his campaign manager. There's been some issues. He gave her a win bonus. That is not abnormal. I've worked on plenty of campaigns you can get win bonuses. Well, it's just interesting to me that, that Big Luther would be called to testify for Lowell Barron. Or, or well, he has first-hand knowledge. So yeah, I, and yeah. Well, interestingly enough, you know, uh, as a journalist, you know, I request information from the Attorney General's office often. And that... You know, two years ago, Luther said he was going to hold these press conferences weekly or monthly. He held two in a row, and he hasn't held anything since. That office has been a black hole of information. And I think Kevin Turner, his chief deputy, is behind the mess that's over there at the AG's office. That's just my personal opinion. Well, why don't we invite him to come on and talk to us? I have invited him on, and Kevin Turner told me he wasn't going to let him come on because he didn't like you. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first man to say that, Bill. I'm sorry. <laughs> really, we got about 30 seconds. I'm just seconds. so lovely and, and sweet. Why well, you we are. That? There's no doubt about it. We got about. We don't 30 like seconds. strong women. We both know that by now. <laughs> well, you know, you're taller than most men we know, and and better looking and smarter. So my it makes a little Four inch heels, tough. maybe. It's, but you know, Luther. I mean, come on. Even with my four inch heels, I might have to look up to him. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, and, and you know, Joe Hubbard has made a lot of hay with this thing, this different thing, this not getting out here and all that. We got to get out of here. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our guest coming up is the former chair of the college Republicans. She's got a lot to say. Stay put. We'll be right back. The V is sponsored by Spot On Strategies Group. In 1977, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. The odds of that same boy then making it to the U.S. and European pro golf tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the U.S. Open twice, one in 1.2 billion. The odds of him having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 88. Ernie Els encourages you to learn the signs of autism.
Here's what customers are saying about WeatherGuard Lifetime Metal Roofing. Knocked the roof out in about a day and a half, and then they threw in our shed with the spare parts they had. It was just a wonderful blessing to the, to the fire station. The tax credit was a big bonus. Hello, I'm Robert Wells, president of WeatherGuard. We are a family-owned business, and we will back our lifetime warranty for generations to come. Come by our showroom on Alton Road in Birmingham. WeatherGuard Lifetime Metal Roofing, 533-7322. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our guest today is Stephanie Patelos, chairman of the College Republican Federation of Alabama. Former chairperson, I guess. Yes, sir, I as that. of this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. I get this chairman, chairperson, chair all confused. <laughs> I'm showing my age here, I suppose. I have been an admirer of yours. You, you've done great work as the, the chairperson of the College Republicans. And I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a really interesting year. It's been fun. You now have a new job. Yes, You've sir. You moved on. Yes, you're sir. You graduated college. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Yes, sir. I graduated and I was lucky enough to get a job right out of school. I'm the media and government relations representative for an online company called Proctor U. We're based out of Hoover. And uh, what we do is we proctor online exams for universities and professional organizations. And we do it through webcams and screen sharing technology. And uh, we work with people in over 75 countries. We work with over 500 institutions around the world. And it's great. I'm working for this wonderful, successful startup. That's great. What's the website? It's ProctorU.com, P-R-O-C-T-O-R-U.com. Can't get enough free publicity, you know. <laughs> Thanks. During your tenure, there was times of controversy, things that came up. Because you are, in many ways, the face of the new Republican Party in that you're young, you're passionate, you're aggressive, and you don't always agree with the old guard. Is that true? Yes, sir. You could say that. Um, there's definitely been some uh, differences of opinion between people in the party this year. And uh, the party's going through a lot of changes. And if we're going to win over the youth vote and we're going to win back the White House and win back this uh, Congress and the Senate, then we've got to make some changes in how we recruit young people and how we appeal to them. And uh, I think that the party has a lot of work to do to pull those people in, but it's been really inspiring to see the young people this year come together and speak up and, and you know, start trying to fight for what they want and fight for the direction that the party should go and how they see it should go. In a perfect world, what are some of the changes you would like to see take place or evolve over time? You know, we're Republicans. We don't change very quick. Uh, so what are some of the thoughts that you have of how you'd like to see the party evolve? You know, I just, I, I just wish the party would focus on more fiscal issues and, and work on electing strong Republicans that will build uh, strong business communities and that will help to create jobs for young people. I know too many friends of mine that are working at Domino's with college degrees and you know, too many people that have just ended up in a master's program or in law school because they couldn't find a job anywhere. And that's not fair. You know, we should be able to have a better life than what our parents and grandparents had. And we're the first generation that's not going to have that in America. And that's really sad. And that's what we need to be fighting for is the important issues that are really affecting our communities and really affecting our state. And that's making sure that we have a strong business environment for young people to be entering into. It's, it's a scary time to be in college and to be a recent college graduate. It really is. Well, it's a scary time for our economy altogether, but just starting out, it's not what it used to be. One of the things that some of the young folks have problems with are the social issues. Mm -hmm. And we see more and more young college Republicans leaning more libertarian. Am I right in that assumption that we see more of a libertarian bent out there nowadays? Yes, yes, sir. There's definitely um, different values from the young people to the older folks in the party and the things that they are working for to change in the party and what they want to see happen. Um, and, and that's just because we're in such a tough time um, in the economy and it's such a hard time to get a job as a young person. And so 
and they're, they're more libertarian leaning just because of the environment that they've grown up in. And we grew up in a different era and a different time, very much so than people your age or my yeah. grandparents' age and things like that. Yeah, well, we grew up on all in the family. You grew up on Will and Grace. <laughs> it's a little different now. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that I, I saw a couple of weeks ago at the winter dinner, and mm -hmm. I know you being on the executive, part of the executive committee, you were there. One of the things that we saw is this sort of uh, purging almost mm -hmm. of certain candidates from the GOP primaries because they didn't fit a particular mold or somebody's idea of what a real Republican was. You had some issues with that, didn't you? Yeah, I really did. I really felt like a lot of the people who were being challenged on the ballot were being challenged for who they were as individuals, not for, you know, what they did with the Democratic Party or what they are going to do for the Republican Party. They're being challenged for just, um, you know, personal reasons and just political reasons. And I think there's a few legitimate challenges involving residency and people not filing their economic interest forms in time and, and legal issues like that. But um, just to go and, and you know, criticize someone's Facebook for a few posts where they, you know, campaigned for one Democrat, you know, right. or where they gave less than $500 to one or two Democratic friends. Um, you know, there's, certain, there's definitely some instances of people who were removed from the ballot who it was, um, it wasn't merited at all. Yeah, well, there's one particular person who on their Facebook page had favored uh, Judge Vance over Judge Moore. Right. Now, we know that there were any number of Republicans who favored Judge Vance over Judge Moore because they did not want to see a repeat of the Ten Commandments, what some call fiasco. And this goes back to sort of what I think you and the young Republicans are seeing right now is that we don't want to get tied down to that past that divided us. We're looking for a future that unites us. Is, mm -hmm. Am I right in that assumption? Right. Yes, sir. And, and we need to find the 80% the of issues we agree on and focus on those and not just fight about the 20 or 10% of things that we disagree on. Um, the person you're speaking of is Ginger Pointer. Right. And, you know, she's a lawyer and she, you know, has a passion for the law. And, and I just don't think that she could in good conscience um, support uh, Judge Moore for what he did and how he just blatantly ignored a court order. And, you know, I haven't voted very many times. I'm still young, but I've never voted straight ticket Republican. And I think that it's okay to cross party lines. I think people should be diligent when they're choosing their candidates and they should look at the individual, not just the party. We've got about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. What do you see in your future as far as candidate, lobbyist? Where, where are you going? You're a bright <laughs> woman with a wonderful future. What do you got in mind? Oh, I'm just going to stay at this online company and see where it takes me, stay active in the Young Republicans, and I don't really have any big plans, just figuring it out. Well, we wish you every, every good good luck in your life, and we hope to have a lot more people like you in, in, in government in the future. So thank you for being thank here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Our guest today has been Stephanie Patelos. You're watching The V. We'll be right back. The V is sponsored by Ginger Barbie, attorney at law. And MediaWorks Communications, video production services for all your video production needs. Here's what customers are saying about WeatherGuard Lifetime Metal Roofing. Knocked the roof out in about a day and a half, and then they threw in our shed with the spare parts they had. It was just a wonderful blessing to the, to the fire station. The tax credit was a big bonus. Hello, I'm Robert Wells, president of WeatherGuard. We are a family-owned business, and we will back our lifetime warranty for generations to come. Come by our showroom on Alton Road in Birmingham. WeatherGuard Lifetime Metal Roofing. 533-7322. It's time to take a road trip. In Alabama, the road and the restaurants are calling. We've elevated barbecue to an art form. 
a meat masterpiece. Fine dining your thing? National awards are putting us on the map. Because everything's fresh and local. And if you like your dinner with a view, well, you can't beat this. Alabama has a road trip with your name on it. Which one you gonna take? Welcome back to the Voice of Alabama Politics. Stephanie Patelis, she was great. She, she's a wonderful young woman. I think she's got a super future. She expressed, like a lot of young Republicans, they are less concerned about these social issues and much, much more concerned about fiscal issues. Baron, what's your take on this? I do think a lot of the younger Republicans are less interested in the social issues and more interested in limiting the size and scope of government and limiting the budgets and taxes. That is where the Republican Party is moving, and I don't think it's just the younger people. Uh, I'm kind of caught in between the young Republicans and the old Republicans. Uh, you see it in the young Republicans, you see it in my generation, and you're seeing it in some of the older generation that said, all right, we're fed up with the divisive issues. We're fed up with the things that cause us to divide. Let's get back to limiting the size and scope of government, because while we're over here fighting on gay marriage and all these other types of issues, uh, in the meantime, the Democrats are making great headway on taking this country down a path of, of well, social ruin. The bottom line is people care about pocketbook issues. They care about making their mortgage, their car payment, their utilities, their gas, and that's, that was the original thing that, right. that the Republicans bought back during the Reagan era, the Reagan Republicans, and in order to win the White House in this country again, that's what we've got to get back to. I mean, I'm a longtime Republican, but social issues never determine who my candidate is for a presidential candidate or a gubernatorial. I, I think Republicans Republicans traditionally, in the course of history, have said, certainly this century up until recently, really care about your wallet, state, keeping what? government out of your wallet and keeping government out of your bedroom. But we got all these new laws that are passed. Where Republicans talk about limited government. And they're anything but that. Well, exactly. I mean, you, you take these last four years, and particularly this year, we're talking about less government. We have passed more regulatory bills in this last le two legislative sessions. We've gone to regulate and suntan booths now. Well, this is not a small government Republican group here. This is a big government Republican group who is more about, in my opinion, lining their, their own pockets and pockets of their friends. And, and these social issues, most of them are just pandering to their base. But listen, th this is terrible stuff here, what you're saying. They're big government Republicans. They're not limited government. And, and there's a lot of trouble here. The corporate there? capitalists are running the state. Right. Well, the good thing, we do have, and I'll just say this, we do have some moderate Republicans in the state. You take, I'm going to say for an example, you take somebody like Paul Sanford from the Huntsville area. Right. He is a conservative Republican, but he sees what the small businessman needs and then the corporate world. And he's, he's really uh, elevated himself and has become a very strong leader in yeah. this uh, legislative session. He's well, you, an independent you, you, voice. You mentioned, the, you mentioned the regulations. Go ask a tanning bed owner and a barber if they think the Republican leadership is the, le is the government of small government. Yeah. They're not. They, they, they've, they've passed restriction after restriction on business after business. Phil Graham used to say, I give everything the Dickie Flats test. He's a printer in Mahia, Texas, who never gets ink from under his fingernails. And every bill I vote on, I think, how is that going to affect Dickie Flats? Well, these folks think it's how is it going to affect their big, their, their big friends that are making big bucks off of big government. But another thing that's been coming up here is there's push polling out there. Mike Hubbard and his cronies, this incumbent protection group, is push polling against other Republicans. Jack, you know some about that. Well, I have a candidate I'm working with in Jasper County Rose, police chief, uh, law and order type person, very conservative, uh, grew up in a great Christian family. Her dad was fire chief, and she's running against... Uh, one of Mike Hubbard's lieutenants, and already in her district, phone surveys have gone out saying, would you still vote for her if you knew she was being supported by Barack Obama and the liberal <laughs> NEA? This woman has probably never voted for a Democrat in her life, and yet, because she is not part of the regime down here, she's being savaged by phone calls. And it's not just that district. It's going out all over yeah, the state, east, right. west, north, south Alabama. These calls are going out saying, if you're challenging an incumbent Republican, you must be backed by Obama and the AARP and the NEA and the, the war on coal. I mean, we know who's doing it. It's not, they're not hiding it. It's just a matter of and, they're not disclosing and it. And in full disclosure, the same poll went out in Lee County where Mike Hubbard resides and has drawn an opponent. Right. Yeah, they, you know, the bottom line is competition is healthy. I don't care if it's an elected position or anything. You do not 
No one needs to have a selected hand path that we're this candidate, this person, this business. Competition is healthy for America. And as Republicans, that's what we should believe is in competition. Well, the only we, incumbent... The, weed, the bads, weed the bad ones out, get rid of them, and let's get somebody in. Yeah, the only incumbent protection plan there ought to be is that you do your job and do it the way you're, the folks in your district expect it to be done. You know, they're not raising the kind of funds they thought they would either. Mike Hubbard said he had $10 million on hand for incumbent protection. They got about a million, maybe a million and a half. Isn't that right, Barry? Well, storming the State House PAC, which we've renamed Drizzle PAC, <laughs> the, the, the drizzling the State House PAC has, has raised a whopping zero dollars in the last 60 days. Yeah. I mean, that, that is not an incumbent what protection. What Storm PAC doesn't realize is it's about to meet Tsunami PAC. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it might have something to do with all the gossip and innuendos and rumors over in Lee County, and we, we know, oh, that's what, that, that money's not from my children's fund. Okay, oh, I see, I see no, what it is. Oh, no, this is Lee but, County That's, that's from learning through sports. Let, let's, talk about, let's talk about these uh, PACs, and then the other thing we cannot really ever trace, y'all, is these 501c threes and fours yeah. where they're hiding all this money. We don't know where it's coming right. from. But I think it's very interesting. I, I was just scanning some of this yesterday. The 2014 pack, which is Governor Riley and Mendes and right. Mike and, and everybody else's. But they have given one senator $97,000 already. We're not even out of session. Who's that? That would be the senator from uh, Lee County. Senator Tom Watley, who uh, has opposition, I think, in the primary. I'm not sure about the Democrat general. Tim Watley. They gave him 97000 It ain't enough. <laughs> well, well it, look, and to be fair, Watley has only given Barack Obama 4600 of them. The, and uh, he was a <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, look, this whole thing, it, it's laughable. It, it, it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious and it wasn't involving. But it's, it's factual and it's true. Right, right. You know, 2014 is going to change the Republican Party in, in some way. Uh, they're still going to be in control, but... Jack, what do you think the future of the party is? It's kind of hard to say. I, I, all I say is I, I want my 15 minutes of fame to come on November the election day in 2014. Well, because well, it may I be, think we need to change some things. Well, I think That's it's right. going to come in June because really, you know, it's really general elections are not the big deal anymore. They wouldn't be putting all this money in. They wouldn't be doing all these push polls right now trying to tie these people to Obama, health care and people. If, if it wasn't in June. They're trying to keep all these one-term wonders who don't know how to run a campaign, and certainly it's proven they sure as hell don't know how to govern. Well, well, wait a minute, 22 of them aren't even running again. 22 of those freshmen that came in in 2010 with, with uh, the Speaker Hubbard, for some reason, just aren't running. Well, that's a huge turnover. Listen, speaking of turnover, we got to get out of here, but we're here every Sunday, and we want you to be here with us. We are The V. Catch us on ABC 3340 in Birmingham or ABC 32 in Montgomery. Thank you for watching. See you next week.